Hello, this is Frank J. Avella with Awards Daily. Nuclear Family is a riveting three-part HBO documentary that examines the complex, loving, and sometimes destructive power of family. 40 years ago, two women decided they wanted children, and at that time, it wasn't something gay people really did. So they enlisted the help of two gay sperm donors. This daring choice would lead to a lawsuit and a landmark court decision. In the series, filmmaker Rai Russo Young looks deep into her family's past with remarkable honesty and empathy to uncover many of the gray areas in this deeply personal story. Hi, Rai, and congrats. It's a remarkable and brave piece of filmmaking. Thank you. Um, Great to be here. Great. Uh, Rai, can you discuss um, being ready to explore your past at this point in your life and your career? Yes. Um, I was always afraid of making a Me and My Problems documentary and having any kind of film um, that felt self-indulgent or uh, felt navel-gazing. So I was reticent to tell this story. At first I was thinking maybe it would be a fiction film because I come from fiction filmmaking. I've made you know, five uh, fiction features before this. Uh, but the issue with that was in trying to make a fiction film, I realized that I didn't really understand the story that I wanted to tell. And I didn't understand my own feelings uh, about the characters and about the story. So when I realized that it should be a documentary and then it became a docu-series, part of that realization was realizing that I didn't have to know all the answers and that the film itself would lead me to discovering how I felt. Wow. Uh, and, you know, I had quite the visceral feeling watching the doc. The three quarters of the way through episode one, I, I got super frustrated. Um, but then the way it ended, I realized there was much more to be revealed. At what point did this idea that there was more to the sto your story uh, begin to become clear to you? I always knew there was more to the story. I just didn't really know what it was exactly. <laughs> um, <laughs> what part did you get frustrated? I'm so curious. Oh, uh, with, I felt like, um, no, it was a good thing because it kept me riveted, but I felt like there there wasn't enough about how much Thomas was, lo you know, loved you. And mm -hmm. then that became all of episode two, you know, pretty much. Um, but, you know, I understood it, it, it's, the whole thing is so fascinating because when your moms decided they wanted to try to have a family, there was no blueprint for gay people doing that. Um, it, so placing that in, can you place that into a, a historical context for us? Yes, yes. I think because of where we are now with uh, the, you know, the proliferation, the world that we live in where gay people have families and are entitled to have families uh, and allowed to, um, we forget because literally in the last 40 years, all of this progress has been made. 40 years ago, gay culture and gay people were a completely renegade, subjugated culture. Uh, gayness was still seen as a sickness. And the idea that gay people could have families, it didn't exist. It wasn't possible. Gay people thought that if, and this is what my one of my mothers says in the film, that if you came out, it meant you were giving up the right to have a family. That was a part of coming out. Part of being gay meant that you were sidelined in this sort of dirty underbelly culture and you didn't have a family. So the idea that gay people could have families and that they could have a quote unquote a normal life like everybody else was completely revolutionary. And when my mothers discovered this little pink pamphlet that uh, showed a, a lesbian inseminating herself using literally a turkey baster, it was a complete miracle to them. And what the documentary is doing, you know, it's about a lot of things, but one of the things is it's telling the history of how gay people came to have families. And it's sort of this completely untold history that's never really been told before. You're absolutely right. And I think that's one of the, the really important things about it. Also, the extraordinary way that they got to have a child. And then she conceived immediately. You know. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> but also, to your point, um, you know, the pioneers pay the price. And in a sense, 
both for my mom's and for my sperm donor and my sister's sperm donor, this was completely unchartered. And because they were the first, they made all of the mistakes and they didn't know how to do it. And so they were fumbling and they were making it up as they went along. And when you're the first, you often make mistakes. Oh, of course. And well, you know, it's a tricky thing being a parent. You, you truly want what's best for your child. Um, and, and to somehow separate that from what you want as a parent is really difficult, if near impossible, especially when you feel like your world's being threatened. And we see that with Sandy and Robin. Yeah, I mean, and you know, I didn't, uh, another th tipping point for me in the process of making this docu-series was that I became a parent myself. And having um, children allowed me to sort of understand the stakes of the story and to understand it on a deeper level because I realized how much your children mean to you. And it's almost inconceivable to really recognize that on an emotional level until you have kids. And then you think, all I wanna do is protect this child. This is the most critical, important thing. This is my mission in the world is to keep this child safe. And so, it allowed me to understand everyone's choices in a whole new way. Well, I think too, the, the this doc dropping right now with, with abortion rights under, under siege in our crazy country, um, I, I think it, it's, it's really important too to, to find this, this conversation about what defines a family, you know, just because you're a biological, you know, father, does that make you a father? And when do you become, it, the whole thing just opened up this this mega can of wonderful worms actually to, to really, you know, have a conversation. Absolutely, there's, I mean, there's also, and the film gets into this a bit, there's a long history of the courts being absolutely horrible to women um, and misogynist. And that is what happened in my mother's case in a lot of ways, you know, my, sperm donor used tactics saying that my mom had suffered from lesbian fusion, which a psychologist came in and testified and said that they were uh, fused together and it was a sickness and that I was a part of that sickness. And you see that in the courts today, specifically with abortion. There are still, and you saw that with Alan V. Farrow, you know, there are still these horrifying tactics being taken in lawsuits and by the courts that play to um misogyny yeah yeah it's about winning at all costs and yeah it's happening now with well i won't get into depp and herd because that's just insane um a, a tricky question there's this notion of brainwashing a child against another parent um this happens with divorces obviously maybe brainwashing is too strong a word but what i saw via the doc was a narrative being presented to you as fact and it was you know we we said this earlier it was only one part of the story as that began to unfold and as you got to speak to Thomas's um, friends, uh, how did you personally begin to, uh, how did your feelings for him begin to personally change? Well, um, yeah, now brainwashing, you know, at the time they called it brainwashing, now they call it alienation. So it's sort of a softer word, but it's the idea mm -hmm. that, um, you know, an adult can, uh, brainwash or alienate a child from another adult. Um, you know, my feelings, it was complicated making the movie because I, I had to wear many hats as the director and producer and um, subject. And the two, you know, the two sort of most warring hats were the filmmaker part of me that knew what I needed to get in a way and was sometimes editing in my head and was thinking, had a shot list. Uh, and then the other part of me was the subject, which was on complete emotional, uh, how do I put this, on a road that felt like it wasn't sturdy. Mm. I was on an, on an emotional terrain that was very, very bumpy. And so in interviews and whatnot, I had to go in very vulnerable and open hearted and just really try to listen and not judge things mm. and allow them to affect me and have that be my truthful response. So in some ways, a lot of what I heard was surprising and allowed me to kind of rethink some of my assumptions. And that was a big part of the process of the film. 
Um, there's this intense scene in, in the doc where you play footage for your moms uh, from friends um, of your donor dad uh, getting and getting real time responses. Uh, that was a very, very interesting choice for you to do. I'm, I'm curious, was that like the first take, if you will, or do you know what I mean? Uh, I think I know what you mean. I mean, that I, I should say, I Liam, the editors and I, my amazing two editors, Paisy and Ben, uh, had edited an entire version of the film that was around two and a half hours long. And it did not include the scene where I go to my mother's and talk to them. And we all felt that something was missing, but we weren't sure what. And my wonderful producer, Dan Kogan, said to me, I think you need to go back to your mothers and talk to them about this. Maybe consider showing them some footage of Chris and what she says and have a conversation. And I was like, oh no, you're <laughs> right. Oh, I, you're right. like, I knew it, that he was right and that it was gonna be one of the most painful, hardest things I had to do because I didn't wanna hurt them. And by asking them to do this documentary, it was already subjecting them to reliving a traumatic experience and asking them to go to a time in their lives that was extremely painful for them. So it was already a huge ask. And then to go back to them again and to confront them, <laughs> you know, yeah. uh, just felt so daunting and so painful. And I loved them so much and I didn't want to hurt them. But I also felt that, or I really knew that we were the kind of family that could have a hard, really difficult discussion and get through it. And I had faith in them as being people that could take it and that could engage with me on a really sophisticated, emotional, difficult level. So I was very nervous going to them and talking to them and having that conversation. And that was a five hour conversation. Wow. And it's, I think, about uh, 14 minutes in, in the docuseries. Um, but it's interesting because my editors, after we shot those five hours, they had watched some of the footage. And I remember Paisy said to me, she said, do you have a sense of what, you know, what parts you would use? And I said, I think it's the part when I say, you know, who, who was it really for? Was it for you or for me? And she said, yep, I thought the same thing. But that's exactly what we were thinking. And I was like, right. So we knew where the core was, you know? Uh, you, well, you handled it with such grace. Though. See, I, I'm Sicilian and we yell a lot. And, you know, I, I never felt like, you know, you ever, you, you know, you ever went to that place where you, you're just like, this was your fault. How could you do this? You know, which is something in my family that we would do right away. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I, I think I've always wanted to, whether it's a fiction film or a documentary, it's just like everybody is human and everybody has their reasons. And to try to understand, especially in today's polarized thinking where there's these factions of people that hate each other and that everybody thinks that everybody else is crazy, but people do have their own reasons at least for doing what they do and to try to understand them and to meet them on their level is kind of to me one of the great challenges of being a human you're absolutely right and being a, a filmmaker that you know isn't necessarily you know can can have some sort of even keel even in your situation where you're the subject um in the doc you take us through the court battle but you, you focus on the human toil it took on your parents your bio father most of all on yourself and your sister you guys were treated almost like collateral damage um i think in court systems you know i think in court cases the children probably you know they suffer a lot because the court and and despite how much the parents might want to, you know, my moms really did try to protect me from this uh, legal case and from court psychiatrists having to talk to me, from lawyers having to talk to me, from the judge having to talk to me. But once a trial is in motion and that's happening, you know, there's not a lot of options. And they were told by their lawyers, you have to subject her to these things, otherwise you're going to lose. So they, um, you know, they tried, but yes, it, it was a very traumatic experience for my sister and I in completely different ways. 
Yeah. Oh, wait, well, it was also, it was a bit disconcerting how the second donor just kind of slipped out of the picture. I, I assume he ended up dying. He did end up dying of AIDS um, and he wanted, he really refused to sort of take a side during the trial. And that was very hurtful um, specifically to my sister because she was really counting on him standing up for her and our family. What, what are your feelings towards Thomas, towards your donor uh, dad now? Um, or is it continuously evolving? I think the movie, the docuseries has really helped me find more peace with my feelings. Um, and those feelings are uh, not simple. And there, there are a lot of different feelings at once. And I think what the docuseries allowed me to do was to hold all of those feelings at the same time and not feel like it has to be good or bad or love or hate. It, it can be a little bit of all of those things um, at the same time. And that's okay. Uh, Which is hard for us because we live in this world of, you know, good and evil and uh, the bad guys and the good guys and the witches and the fit, you know, and the ingenues and, and it's just life is uh, in a good, good way, much more complicated than that. How did we get there? I wonder, you know, I look around and I'm thinking it just happened in a few years. Obviously, it had to have been festering. But, you know, I mean, you bring up a good point that it's insane. And it's not just on the right. It's on the left as well. It's everywhere. Mm -hmm. Sorry. <laughs> just <laughs> Totally. Uh, I, I agree. Yeah. Um, are you in touch with any of uh, Tom's family or friends? Yes. I mean, I, I interviewed his sister, Angela, for the film, um, and she actually didn't end up making the cut because we didn't have enough different parts of her to sort of span three episodes. Um, and we could only have so many amazing people in the film. Um, but yes, I'm still in touch with some members of his family and with Chris and the people that I interviewed for sure. And uh, with are, are things all good with your mom and your sister, Cade? Yes, everything's great with them. In good. a way, we grew even closer as a result of the film. Um, where has the project and the process left you in terms of your journey as an artist? Um, in, that's a really interesting question, which I think I'm still figuring out the answer in some ways, um, <laughs> because a part of me feels extremely fulfilled personally by making, by the process of making this series. And another part of me, as with any film, is always like, okay, what what am I going to do next? What, what do I do now? It's left me in a lot of ways wanting to tell true stories, um, maybe in a fiction form, but stories that are grounded in reality. At the same time, you know, it looks like I might go do this action movie. So, <laughs> which is like a complete palate cleanser and couldn't be more different. So the truth is, I think as a, as a filmmaker, I like to do it all because I like to challenge myself and kind of live through the full scope of experience. Um, so I think I'm going to keep mixing it up. Right. I know that it was the concept was originally that this might have been a scripted um, narrative uh, film with so many docs uh, being turned into narrative films lately. Do you think you might ever want to do this? I'm developing a narrative series with HBO right now uh, based on Nuclear Family. Wow, so, that's yes. wonderful to hear. Um, and uh, who would you want to play you? Oh, um, well, I'm a kid for at least the first season. So, you know, I probably, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> we'll see. Cross that bridge when we come to it. Yeah, not um, a fair question, really. <laughs> but I will say, you know, the narr doing the narrative scripted series thus far has been a really fascinating um, exercise. It's not telling the story of the doc. It's a completely different beast, which, in, which actually feels like taking this idea of empathy one step further, because I have to get into the headspace. My co-writer and I, Anya Epstein, have to get into the headspace of what was Tom thinking in 1982 as a gay man in San Francisco who was an extremely successful civil rights lawyer, defender of gay rights, you know, who was falling in love with this child, who didn't want babies initially, who was changing his tune, like all of those questions and really immersing yourself in each character's psychology at the time is 
far beyond the work that I did in nuclear family. It's a complete, you know, the doc, it's a completely different exercise, which is fascinating. Oh, it does sound fascinating. And, and it brings up this, this notion of how we, you know, we make proclamations like I don't want children, but then when one, when you have one, your world changes, it opens up, it, it's forever changed. Totally. And characters are so interesting when they say one thing and then something else happens to them. You know, the, the yeah. process of self-denial is a really fascinating process. I wanted to ask you about the, um, the video tape because uh, it was a, another extraordinary moment I felt where you received this and you decided I'm not going to watch it. And my God, you know, to, 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 here we are sitting at home going, how can, how can she, how can she not watch it? And then, and then you put it in later, much later, and then only watch a little bit of it. Um, what was all of that like for you uh, to say, I don't, I don't care. And then, you know, grow to want to know what he, I think at first it wasn't that I didn't care about the video. It was that I knew I couldn't handle it emotionally. Um, I knew that whatever it said, I didn't want to hear it. And that I could, that it was going to fuck me up, frankly. Um, and I didn't want to engage in that part of my life. You know, I spent so many years. I mean, the trial lasted from the ages of nine through 14. And then I spent my teen years wanting to cleanse myself of this traumatic experience and not deal with it. And then I spent my twenties trying to sort of like, again, not be defined by the fact that I have lesbian parents or that I had a sperm donor or that I went through this terrible lawsuit and try to just live my life. So the last thing I wanted was a videotape to drudge up, you know, with like a bunch of feelings and perspective that I wasn't ready to hear or think about. So it was more like pushing it away because it was so painful. Right, right. That and makes then, total sense. Yeah. And so it wasn't through like, you know, at least 10 years later of therapy and uh, and just growth in in the world to, to be able to even look at it. And then it wasn't again until having children, having my own family, marrying a man that I loved, feeling more independent from my family and in the world that I was able to then actually look at it and engage with it on an adult independent level. Another really, I think, extraordinary um, part of the doc is where you uh, questioned almost your sexuality. And then when you realized that you were indeed um, straight, uh, you felt like you were betraying your parents. And it's, it's this great, you know, because as, as a, a proud queer man, you know, it, obviously I went through the opposite, you know, right. you feel ashamed. That, and, and so that was fascinating in and of itself. Yes, it's a reverse coming out experience, which is somewhat rare because there hasn't been a ton of kids raised in gay households enough to have a, I'm coming out as straight uh, <laughs> moment. Yeah, and I think that was really a result of the trial because my, my lesbian family, we felt such a need. And this is actually a huge theme in talking to a lot of kids with LGBTQ parents. I've noticed, you know, especially in that first generation, they feel such a pressure and it's not even from their parents, but there is a, pr a pressure to be perfect and to prove to the world that gay families were okay, um, are okay and we're normal and we're healthy. Because when I was growing up, the, the, the word on the street in society was that gay people are sort of sick and they raise sick children. What will the kids be like? Are the kids gonna be screwed up because their parents are gay? That was really the thinking. And I was asked that at 16 on a talk show. So, so we felt like we had to really perform and be normal and healthy and happy. And so any there was any wrinkle from that, it was felt detrimental to the cause that we were trying to defend. Um, so, you know, I think it's all, it's all part of that in a sense. It's crazy. It's like living in a bubble in a way. Yeah. I mean, and so when I, I think what happened with the trial is I had to kind of double down on my normal, on me being normal and healthy in order to defend my family. And that doubling down then caused me to feel like I, 
I couldn't, I didn't want to betray my parents in any way at all. <laughs> like we all had to be perfect. We were all united front and even being straight felt like a betrayal. And so they were like, of course, we love you for whoever you are, you know, straight or gay. But it felt like I was also leaving the world in which I grew up in. And in some ways it's analogous to like border culture. You know, if you grow up in Mexico and then you leave your family of origin and go grow up in another country, there's something lost there. And for me, it was like, oh, I'm going to go join this straight world and leave the gay culture in which I grew up in. When I was in my 20s, I tried to go to a gay bar with my boyfriend at the time and they refused us um this was in ireland oh. and they said no well, you know only gay people allowed in this bar you guys are straight and i burst into tears because i was like this is the nail in the coffin i'm out i'm not because i don't i wasn't i don't you know gayness is not no one says oh she's you know she's culturally queer <laughs> so there was a loss there in some ways that's a good point, though, you know, about how the culture that you came from, you know, and again, it's it is like uh, ethnicity and you want to hold on to that culture and there's nothing yeah. wrong with that. Right. No, exactly. Um, so in some ways, even the making of this docuseries has been validating because it's been a way of connecting with my people um, and with other not just with gay people, but with other kids with gay parents and the whole sort of community. Um, as well as seeing that this docuseries transcends gay culture and is just actually talking about family and that all families have these universal truths of love and loss and betrayal and, and they all go through it. And it's been amazing to see, you know, ch children and parents of divorce or, or of immigration um, issues, like all kinds of families have spoken to um, how much this film means to them. Well, it, it meant a, it meant a great deal to me, I have to tell you, and uh, um, I think I think it's a very important and you know I don't I that word sometimes irritates me, but I do think it's an it's an, an urgent film, and I think it tells an important uh, queer story, but also a universal story. Um, they were they were groundbreakers, you know, they were forerunners, no matter no matter how you look at it, and now what you've done is you've allowed for this extraordinary empathy. So I wanna thank you um, for, for putting this out there and let you know that I am so excited now to hear that it is going to be uh, an actual um, narrative uh, series. Thank you, I appreciate that. Thank you, Rai. Thank you for spending uh, this time with us. It's been nice to chat, thank you. Likewise.